Good afternoon. Welcome to our keynote luncheon for Wednesday. And it's my honor to introduce the keynote speaker today. Admiral Phil Davidson is the current commander of the United States Fleet Forces Command based in Norfolk. He mans, trains, and equips over 125 ships, 1,000 aircraft, 103,000 active duty service members, and government employees. As the commander of fleet forces, he's responsible for providing combat-ready forward forces to the Navy component commanders and the combatant commanders around the globe. We're very fortunate to have the person, the senior person, responsible for the standards, the policies, and the execution of the Navy's force generation system. And since he's standing here ready to go, I'm going to turn the podium over to Phil Davidson. I, I thought I would cut off the pending insult. So who was here for Admiral Harris's discussion yesterday? All right, that's important, because I wanted to offer my own review of Lady Gaga's performance at the Super Bowl, because I think that's actually incredibly important and informative to Force Generation. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I do have to tell you, I'm a little behind on my speech prep. Pete Daly gave me an hour to get organized this morning, and then he and I spent an hour talking and got away from it a little bit. Um, good, I see no title somewhere. But uh, Pete asked me several months ago to talk about Force Generation and how I thought it was going. And I think as a bit of a wrap to the panels, and I understand there's a few left, uh, but as a bit of a wrap to the discussion with the fleet commanders and the type commanders yesterday, I thought I'd offer the perspective from the policy end, and I'll certainly leave some time for questions afterwards. Um, I've got to watch my watch, uh, make sure I don't go on too long. Okay, fourth generation. Too often you read in the newspaper that it's about carrier rotations, and that's only one, one fourth of the things that have to happen in force generation. Force generation is made up of four things, and has to do, excuse me, has to do four things. It has to rotate the force on the regular peacetime, phase zero, hybridized environment, whatever you're thinking about the environment that's going on out there right now, it's gotta train those forces and push it out the door on a routine basis. Number two, our force generation posture has to be able to surge the force. It has to send a whole bunch of the fleet in the right numbers, in the right mix, and the right capability to respond to the O plans that our, our, our component commanders, excuse me, our combatant commanders and our Navy components support um, forward. So having that capacity and capability and readiness in that surge force is an important part of it. Let's do a third thing. It has to find the time and space to maintain and modernize the force. That has to include training time too. So you go backwards, Aegis system, the first one we put a float was back 1983, something like that. The system that we're putting afloat today is fundamentally different. Um, all the iterations of modernization on that system, we've got to be able to find the time to upgrade those is just one example. And then fourth, the fourth thing it has to do, it has to reset all that stuff in, in stride. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean after a big surge in wartime, the ships all come back and we retire those ships and we get new equipment sets. That's not what happens. When I say reset and stride, at the end of a big crisis, you've got to be able to reset the rotation and then reset that surge force to go forward. That's incredibly important. That is force generation. When it's fully resourced and properly executed in terms of policies and practices, it works great. If it's not fully resourced, that's a different problem. And we choose to take risk in some areas of that force generation, both deliberately, and then some of it is a fallout of, of recovering or resetting on the backside of that. If you're watching the Navy closely, though, that definition, those four elements of force generation, is also the definition of readiness. You ask us how our readiness is, we have to speak to it in terms of those four requirements. A ready Navy must do more than just prepare for deployment. It has to be able to do those four things. So we've had a good discussion over the last year about where we really stood on our readiness to do that. It started with the Vice Chief's testimony last February, March 16. I took a group of 06s with me up to the, the HASC uh, Readiness Committee back in May of 16 to talk about 
some of the impacts there, and then, of course, making all the news in the last month as the vice chief at SNA and then in his testimony here a couple of weeks ago. Um, I want you to know, in that fourth generation process, the rotation is what we prioritize. So if you came and you saw the fleet commanders yesterday, and all the fleet commanders, now I didn't see this discussion, but the fleet commanders lined up and they said, hey, life looks great from our end. I love that, because I can tell you, we deliberately prioritize the readiness of the stuff we send forward. Those people, men and women, get everything. Our best capability, the most people, the fuel, the parts, and if something breaks down, we break China to get stuff forward and make it right. <clears throat> that has left us with a problem in the other areas. So we're a little bit on the ragged edge. That, uh, I won't get into all the specifics. The Vice Chief has well articulated this over the course of the last six weeks. But we're on the ragged edge in surge, and we're on the ragged edge in maintenance and modernization because we don't have the resources to execute that. When did this happen? FY16, at least from the fleet perspective, was really the inflection point, the nadir at which the risk was no longer acceptable to take. We couldn't mitigate it internally to our accounts. So FY16 was the first time in my experience at Fleet Forces Command, which dates back to 12 as a staff officer even, um, that we did not get end of year monies from other accounts to buy down the risk, meaning make advanced pur purchases in the subsequent fiscal year. So that ran out in 16, and then as you crack open the books on 17, what was authorized um, in a CR environment, the controls for the fleet are vastly reduced. <clears throat> the insidious nature of cuts like that is important to note. It makes your modernization uneven when you are short of accounts, and truly the only fungible monies in those o &M accounts are two things. They are flying hours, and they are surface ship availabilities that happen in the commercial industry. So when the insidious nature of that declining readiness posture you know, compounds this readiness problem, um, it makes your modernization uneven. If you have to cancel an availability, which includes modernization, and I've actually told everybody in the Navy they can no longer talk maintenance. It's maintenance and modernization, because that's what happens in every maintenance availability maintenance and modernization. Um, you also stop making gains on the over-rotation of the force back during the coin and constabulary force. We've been buying down a lot of that risk. Availabilities have been going long because we've been adding work that was needed to be done during those availabilities in that time frame. It also cuts back on the proficiency of our aviators, and I think that's important. When you cut back flying hours to the extent that you're really only aviating, navigating, and communicating, and not truly doing the warfighting things. You have sufficiency, but you don't have proficiency. And it's important to remember that we have to mitigate that risk. Ultimately, porting money back into a group of aviators that are only sufficient in their skills and not proficient costs us much more in time and money. And time is absolutely a resource. OK, whether you talk or use the words capability or modernization, and I'm telling you right here, that means the same thing. Or capacity and force structure, that means the same thing. Or readiness and force generation, that means the same thing. They are all related. You cannot take a dollar from one in order to put a dollar in another and have that dollar's return be whole. So it's, it's an easy thing to think about. If you decide, oh, I'm going to take care of a capacity problem and I'm going to make all my sailors 100% manned across the board, but you short readiness, which includes the ability to train those sailors in that account, then you can see you're, you're not actually adding a whole dollar's value, right? The second piece, if you want to go after capability or modernization, and you take a dollar from readiness, and you put it in capability and modernization. The fast evolution of technology, and you don't have the training money on the backside, you won't have sailors trained to operate it. And it becomes frustrating to the force, and it's overall frustrating to the readiness. Whether you have new, whether you have lots of it, without readiness, you're not getting that total return. Integrity, <laughs> soundness, wholeness, the integrity of the force 
is dependent on those three things, capability, capacity, and readiness. I talked extensively at SNA, excuse me, um, about our ability to lift all those accounts and what it will mean for us going forward. Okay, so what's going right in force generation? I think it's important to track everything that's being produced. So importantly, the CNO, not long after he came into his office here, he put out a new design, a Navy design for maintaining maritime superiority. What has followed in that was a fleet design that we generated down at the Fleet Forces Command. That's a white paper, that's why many of you won't see it as classified, in fact. Um, that then leads to the discussions about fleet architectures and what it is we need this Navy to do going forward. We've also done a number of things on the process uh, and the initiative side to get things rolling um, correctly in force generation. I'll tell you one of the things that's going well, and it's OFRP. Why? OFRP has given us the insight into these four elements to let us understand where the readiness risk is taken and where the readiness value is returned. I can tell you three things that you do not hear OFRP ships complain about. They don't complain about manning, they don't complain about money, and they don't complain about deployment length. That's a pretty good place to be with the fleet. I've been in the Navy for 35 years. Um, those are three things that they like to complain about a lot. And uh, we're in a much better uh, space there. I can tell you the, the strike group commanders are all raving about it when they come back as well. Very pleased with the assembly of the team. It's just one of the components, manning. The manning in an OFRP strike group is being made whole much earlier in the cycle. If you were tracking four or five years ago, very late in the game, post com x we were still porting sailors with, with what we call uh, uh, cross decks and team ad actions um, at the last minute. Now you think about, you've got a fighting unit, whether you're on a destroyer or you're in an uh, aviation squadron, and you're adding team members post basic training, post advanced training, and you're expecting them to go out on deployment and do well. Not a great place to be. So we've moved all that 12 months left. So the people are generally arriving 12 months in advance, and they now benefit from the basic training, the advanced training, and the leadership in those ships and in those squadrons gets to identify talent and make sure they're on the right task for that deployment. I think that's very, very important. Last year, five years ago, actually a little less, four years ago, we had 1,200 of these cross decks and team man actions. Last year, we got these down, we call them now TICOM actions, down to 700, and they're all happening a year out. So nobody's getting a phone call that says, hey, go to the ship across the pier, and by the way, you're going on deployment for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months next week. Um, it's a much better place to be. <clears throat> all right, on the equipping side, some of this is insider discussion about what happens at S2 and the relationship with uh, across Echelon 2 with the systems commands as well as um, uh, the resource sponsors up in the building. Um, but we have an integration and interoperability process, excuse me, interoperability and integration process um, that we call uh, baseline configuration change planning. Um, we're looking at strike groups now as a whole. We know we have got a nine-year plan, who's gonna be assembled in these groups, and we look at the capability sets that are in them right now, and then the modernization that is planned. And we are making adjustments to make sure that a capability set that needs to be across that whole system of a strike group, so to speak, is actually the maintenance planning is put in place so that modernization happens at the right wicket so the people train together, the whole group has the capability together and goes forward. Um, on deployment together. <clears throat> uh, that's an important uh, piece of our wholeness overall. And then lastly, training. I think that's another aspect that's going uh, quite well. You've heard me say in several forums that we've made more changes in the last 18 months in Comtex than we've made in the last 18 years. And I could tell you that's very, very true. Um, the, the, the changes that we've made run from the basics of, on the East Coast of the United States at least, restoring fleet missile firing events, which had been suspended for years in the 21st century. We now, everybody gets a shot before they go on deployment at a missile firing event. The last time the East Coast, and this is before the spring of 15, uh, 16, excuse me, 
The last time the East Coast shot a supersonic, uh, shot against a supersonic threat was in 2003. We restored that back in 2016. We did it again for the Bush strike group that just went out the door here, as well as doing some subsonic firings. And we're doing them in complex environments as well, which I think is important. There's another thing that's uh, important changes going on at Comtuex. Um, we've made some adjustments in how we are managing our live virtual constructive concept. Um, the fleet has owned and had an operator support us uh, with, uh, with the um, NCTE, our, our, our simulated training environment that we use in Com2X and in other training um, across the East and West Coast. We've partnered with uh, China Lake um, to better manage that system, and we're better partnered with the systems commands to have a whole concept in LVC uh, that might support our systems commands, their testing and trials, as well as fleet training going forward. We started to experiment that within Com2X about uh, a year and a half ago, a little less, about 16 months ago. And um, it did advance the ball, I, I think, a few yards instead of a few inches here during the Bush, Bush Com 2X just recently. Um, better integrating the insights. It's working pretty well on the surface ship side. We've got a ways to go on the aviation side and, in fact, some investments to make there and investments to make overall. But these are improvements that I'm pretty pleased with. Command and control, that's another aspect that is doing well for us on uh, OFRP. Um, better group ISIC alignment, better alignment with the units that are assigned to them. Um, they get better, uh, uh, the groups I'm talking about, and their ISICs better training themselves. Um, NWDC has come forward with a Fleet 360 game uh, that is helping them uh, game in advance um, some of the skills that they might want to develop so that we get to the actual training phase with live ships, they have uh, better experience. We're also able to get groups and ISICs better ported into the wargaming process. And I'm not gonna go off on a tangent here on wargaming, um, but both NWC and NWDC host some games. Uh, we're able to better resource them with more senior players uh, down the line, and that's helping, uh, the OFRP is helping us do that. Uh, lastly is our training for the number of fleet commanders. Um, many people think uh, we don't have a training and certification process above the unit or group level. It actually goes on for our numbered fleets as well. We just had a team uh, out supporting Sixth Fleet in Naples uh, during one of their joint exercises for UCOM um, where Sixth Fleet regained their certification there, and that's an important part of this whole element. Okay, what can be improved in force generation? Culturally, getting everyone to understand and I mean, you know, those of us uh, that were flying airplanes or wearing swole pins or in submarines, that our networks are a warfighting platform. We've made major gains here just by making 10th Fleet, Flash Fleet, Cybercom, and a separate TICOM and putting that in place. So uh, Naval Information Forces has been a TICOM now for two years. They have found their feet with the platform TICOMs. The platform TICOMs have found their feet with uh, NAV I-4. Um, NAV I-4 is speaking to the fleet in, about networks, but in a language that the fleet can understand. And um, I think we're off and running there. Uh, I do want to get NICTAMs and NCTSs better involved with our training and certification events uh, to kind of bump our group level training up to fleet constructs. Um, those of you who remember in-chopping years ago, you know, you always in-chopped at midnight, right? And there was nobody in the NICTAMs or NCTS to actually there make the connectivities, and you spent 36 hours trying to get your networks all back in place. That doesn't happen anymore. Matt, am I right? Nancy? All right. Um, chops happen over a sequence of time, uh, a day or maybe two days for um, groups uh, coming in. They happen in the daytime when the pros from Dover are on station, and we make sure all the connectivity is sound going forward. Um, that's goodness. We've got more training investments to do in the NAV I-4. We've got more requirements to set in place that the fleet just carries as part of their O&M account that frankly should be resourced. Um, and we got to get to the, the Information Forces uh, Warfighting Development Center. I'll tell you, that's another area in which we've made gains. Warfighting Development Centers, um, 
you know, we, we put that in place really at about the time we began OFRP. We still have some resourcing to do, particularly on the surface side, the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Center. Um, but the fleet has, pretty come, has come to this, uh, stop by the Ensminic booth out here and talk to the lieutenants that are patch wearers. They couldn't be more proud of it. And I can tell you, I thought culturally the surface community would have a tough time uh, taking criticism because for so long we told them, hey, you didn't matter on a ship unless you were in command. And I can tell you the COs listen to the witties and they've come to a, a planning, briefing, execution, debriefing process like our aviators have and we're the better for it going forward. I thought culturally that would be a bigger challenge than it has turned out to be. Now we just need to wrap up the resources, um, make sure that we fully flesh out the people at in SMITIC and the UWDC especially, um, and then get after some of the tools that might help us actually turn a little, turn a little bit faster on the things that we're learning. Okay, here's one, this might be a little surprise to a few people. Something else we need better work on, and that's our understanding of our warfighting organizations. So in the era of great disaggregation, the coin constabulary era that we just exited here in the last couple of years, um, we've undervalued what our tactical and operational headquarters are truly capable of. So much of what the assignments became about, they became about ship on post. Now ships can do a lot and they have a lot of capability, but they don't necessarily include the tactical headquarters that can do more than just what that ship can do. Are you with me? So you send a destroyer out on a station, that destroyer can do what a destroyer is to do. You ask it to plan and execute an area air defense for other units, yeah, not so fast. That's not really what we've trained that destroyer to do. That, that's what we have cruisers for, by the way. Um, restoring this focus on warfighting organizations, ensuring that those warfighting organizations are considered tactical headquarters and operational level headquarters, numbered fleets, instead of staff, is incredibly important. An era in which our numbered fleet commanders may have to perform the duties of a support TED commander instead of a support team commander is absolutely here right now. We had a long holiday, an aberration in the maritime environment in which our operational level commanders only had to be support ding commanders, blue in support of green. That era has now shifted and we've got to have those people better organized and resourced. It also is something we need to consider when we talk about formations. In the area, era, excuse me, of disaggregation, we were perfectly satisfied to put that destroyer out on a point station in this very benign environment and all the tools and understanding that he would or she would ever need is out there on that point station. That may not be enough. So the formations that we put in the battle space cannot necessarily be cobbled together in a ad hoc mission for a, a mission like maritime security ops, okay? Uh, it was acceptable for maritime security ops. May not be acceptable for a sea control fight, for a power projection fight. Those smaller two ship, three ship formations are put on station to do a task, not a mission. And we have to think about that, particularly in an era of sea control, power projection, what others call high end war, uh, war fighting going forward. Okay, and then lastly, we probably need better alignment and force generation. We have just one Navy right now. This Navy is of a size and shape that any crisis that goes on in the planet, the resourcing for it is gonna come from the Pacific and the Atlantic. And a more holistic, common language across the two fleets would be important, I think, uh, for all those uh, forward forces that we provide, or excuse me, forward commanders that we provide forces for going forward. And um, that's something that we need to work on in the next year or two. Okay, that kind of covers it. If you take away anything from this conversation, I'd like you to recall, force generation, OFRP, has to do four things. It has to be able to rotate the force. It has to be able to surge the force. It has to be able to maintain and modernize the force, and it has to be able to reset the force in stride on the backside of a major crisis or on the backside of war going forward. And that the people that we do send forward, and the reason that you've heard the numbered fleets talk about it yesterday, say, yeah, hey, the readiness looks pretty good to us, is we're touching those guys every three years right now to push them out the door, uh, um, but we're taking risk in surge and maintenance and modernization to make that happen. All right, I'm happy to take your questions.
<clears throat> See, when I, when I do a fleet all hands call, I usually I get the same response, and I usually I'll give a coin to the first person to ask a question. So, like, nine people run to the microphone. So, Pete, you don't get a coin. <laughs> Admiral, thanks for those remarks mm -hmm. and uh, appreciate that rundown on a very important process. Uh, could you elaborate just a little bit more about, you know, supported, supporting, and the mm -hmm. fact that we are emerging from this fairly permissive environment where oftentimes the Navy was an enabler, mm -hmm. a supporter. Um, what work and what lift has to be done among others in the joint force to view the Navy in a different light, and also, have we done enough work to define as a service, as a culture, how we fight? Yeah. The um, two-part question. I'll try to remember the second part, Pete. Yell at me if I don't r recall it. Uh, on the first part, we have to make plain for our joint partners what our warfighting organizations were. I can tell you, when I was a strike group commander back in 2010, I. General McChrystal and General Rodriguez came out um, to the strike group and uh, they did not understand what it was I did or, or my staff did until I said, well, I'm the tactical headquarters that makes all this go, oh, I get that. And so I mean, trust me, the Army knows all about what an operational and tactical headquarters is and for. And we have to do a better job of explaining that um, going forward, I think. So that's the first part. Remind me of the second question. Yeah, on the how we fight side, I think, you know, in my darkest moments, I worry that the Navy, that people think the Navy is this monolith that never changes. And the one thing I really, really know is the Navy is nothing but change. So I tell people all the time, I'm on my fourth Navy. And, uh, you know, I was in the Cold War Navy, and I was in that Post Desert Storm Navy, and I was in that 911 Navy. Now I'm in this Navy, in the maritime environment that we're experiencing in the Gulf, in the Red Sea, in the southern Mediterranean, and you know, to an extent, what's happening out in the Western Pacific. It's a different Navy that takes a different requirement. And understanding what those warfighting organizations are, as we come out of this era of constabulary, coin, operations, is incredibly important. Um, the era of disaggregation, in which we could put all these people out on a point station, not worry about maneuver, not worry about networking, not worry about their integration with the total fleet apparatus, you know, down so that the whole mission was required. Uh, again, that's gone past. When you think about what we need going forward, a lot of those attributes are required now. This is a Navy whose you know, foundation was in the idea that it could maneuver globally going back 240 years. Restoring that understanding to the combatant commander structure is incredibly important because everything that they learned in the last 15 years when we jointed you know, naval presence around the world was, I get this much stuff and it shows up on this station at this time and I don't have to worry about anything else. Um, but in fact, you're starting to see now as we conduct strikes, not only from the Persian Gulf, but from the East Med, in the Gulf of Sidra, you know, how important this strategic capability is going forward. Restoring the war fighting, the operational level, command and control as a supported commander, and the tactical command and control on how you dictate a maneuver fight with those organizations is incredibly important because the joint community never had to understand that before um, as we have got really joint over the last 15 years. I think that's an important part of what we're doing uh, moving forward. I, I have to commend Admiral Swift, certainly in the Pacific, for what he's targeting with the Swift signals. Um, he has a design as well for his people that, you know, Admiral Swift is worried about stuff and happening right this second. Um, what we've done with the fleet design and where we're going with the distributed maritime ops doctrine that is to come uh, later this year is meant for the Global Navy um, to put this in doctrine um, and become part of the, the process overall of our training going forward. All right, next question.
I'm Dick Mackey, an old naval aviator. Hi, Admiral Mackey. How are you? Very, very simple question. When you put together a strike group, what is the composition, your, your ideal composition when you put together a strike group? The one I'm putting out right today is an aircraft carrier with five escorts. Do I think that is the sole composition and the composition I need going forward? I don't think it's likely enough. Um, uh, we're at where we're at based on the resources that have been provided. And I think to a certain extent, when, you, when we have a discussion about 355, and trust me, we didn't pull that number out in December. We've been working on this for a long time. Um, it's to make these strike groups uh, uh, create better wholeness in these strike groups going forward. Hi, Sydney Friedberg. Hi, Sydney. Uh, from Breaking Defense, hello. Let me ask, you know, as you, I, you touched on this, I think, but as you look across the different components that you work with, where are the biggest holes in readiness? What is the thing that most uh, causes you anxiety or requires the most marginal resources if you get them? Be it, you know, you said things about pilot training, you said things about training strike group command. Uh, what are some of the, th what are the things that are the biggest holes uh, in your picture of, of the readiness of the fleet? You're, you're, uh, I'm sorry, Sidney, you're talking about manning, training, equipping kind of items? Is that what you're saying? My concerns right now are centered on aviation. So where we are with the number of available aircraft that we have, um, our ability to resource flying hours and create proficiency in our aviators, and keep the seed corn developing out of Sinatra are my number one concern in the current budget environment. Next question. You can call me on the phone. <laughs> Sir, what I wanted to do was pass along a question I got this morning that I thought was really, really good. I was able to partially answer it, but I suggested to the Marine, who apparently is not here today, this afternoon. Um, the question was about how well we're preparing our Navy and Marine Corps team to operate in the denied, degraded environment, electromagnetic spectrum, and cyberspace. Of course, my ability to answer half of that was pretty good. The blended solution though for how we're operating um, together with the Marine Corps in your preparing the fleet to go forward it was more along the lines of the question yeah I suggested that he actually bring it up at lunch but I don't think he's here okay um, we're we're testing that blended need uh, during Comtwex now the Marines are have come to the understood I should not a difficult choice for them don't don't infer comments that I'm not trying to put there. You know, they came to the challenge pretty easily, and um, I think we've got a sound, at least defensive, approach uh, on the cyber side. As we start to think about how we use that cyber for our maneuver, we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go with our own amphibious forces. We have a way to go with the Marines in that, particularly as we think about that seam that is going to occur at the land-water interface um, going forward. Much to be done here in experimentation. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to say that our requirements are going to have to be solely accommodated because I want to understand what the marine requirements are going forward, particularly at that interface, um, so that we make this just right. A lot of experimentation is going to go on in this. Fundamentally, it's in the background of every amphibious uh, exercise that we're doing. We've got bold alligator later this year, the next live iteration of that. Um, Nora and I were talking about Dawn Blitz yesterday. These things are going to be tested going forward. So. <clears throat> Admiral, in response to uh, your answer to Admiral Mackey about the composition of strike groups mm -hmm. that you're pushing out now, are, are there any thoughts to reintegrate? I'm sorry? Are there any thoughts to reintegrate SSNs integral to strike groups? Are you thinking about that? Well, one of the, you know, if, we're, if you're asking me, are we going back to the tactical model of doing associated support? We're not having that discussion right now. If you're watching the CNO's comments closely, and we are extraordinarily like-minded on this, um, fleet centricity and our ability to network what were stovepipe organizations before is vastly improved. 
And the warfighting collaboration between aviation and surface warfare, between aviation surface warfare and the submarine force has frankly never been better, to tell you the truth. Um, I've got both the, the theater ASW commander in the Atlantic and the MPRA commander um, um, pressing me to add more of their stuff to Comtwix. And again, they're not earning certification in that Comtwix. What they're doing is raising the game of that Comtwix to a fleet understanding. So instead of all this insight being assembled, the stovepipe of MPRA commander, stovepipe of theater ASW commander, stovepipe of carrier strike group commander, all coming together at the fleet level, this information now is able to be shared kind of cross task forces in execution. It's changing a great difference in what we're pushing out the door. It's one of the reasons we're adding training and education and certification to the numbered fleet commanders and the mocks. We gotta raise their game, make sure they understand how these task forces are going to work together so that they work uh, more collaboratively and tactically in situ. This is an incredibly complex discussion, and I, by the look on your face, Doug, I don't think I'm making it any easier. Um, but we've got, we've got capability now in networking and sensing that's going to allow us to leverage our fires across all these former stovepipes of task forces. We've got a little bit of cultural work to make sure that some of that stuff behind the black curtain or some of the stuff in that MTOC you know, down the street is all assembled in the right places and shared in the right manners. But we've actually made a lot of progress on this in the last couple of years. So I'm pretty pleased with it. Is that helpful? All right. I'm going to get off easy. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. <clears throat>